What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kofinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and to learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guest in this week's episode is Michael Howell, the CEO of Cross Border Capital, a London based independent research and investment company that provides asset allocation and capital markets advice to institutional investors. This conversation is a natural follow up to both of my recent episodes with Lev Manand on the shadow banking system and Eric Bismajian on economic cycles, specifically the credit cycle and its leading impact on the economy and asset prices. But it also pulls directly from many episodes that we've done over the years with guests like Michael Pettis on global trade and finance, Claudio Borio on financial instability, Brent Johnson on the revenge of the dollar, James Aitken on digital currency and the pivot to Asia, Russell Napier on the Asian financial crisis, and of course, one of my absolute favorites, a conversation with Kevin Coldiron, Tim Lee, and Jamie Lee on the role of the US dollar as an international funding currency and as the primary driver of recurring systemic crises in the international financial system. Global liquidity, a term that you're gonna hear a lot today, is one that I would venture to guess every single person working in finance and in the financial media has not only heard of, but has probably used at one point or another. And yet, if you were to ask most people what this term means or what it refers to, they would be hard pressed to give you a clear or uniform answer. And that's because the drivers of global liquidity namely the financial and exchange rate relationships within and between countries and the determinants of cross-border flows of money, securities, goods and services are themselves constantly changing and have become, in the words of my guest, the new weapons in the escalating capital wars between the US, Europe, and especially China, which has a vested interest in not only the long-term stability of the international financial system, but perhaps even the eventual aim of displacing the dollar in favor of its own national currency, the yuan, as the fulcrum around which international trade and commerce is eventually invoiced and credited. My goal with today's conversation is not only to help you gain a deeper appreciation for what global liquidity is and the geopolitical and economic forces driving it, it is also meant to help you understand how it impacts you and your portfolio directly through the outsized role that it has on shaping economic outcomes and asset prices during a time when that liquidity is receding faster than at any point since the great financial crisis and by some measures, even faster. As most of you already know, Hidden Forces is listener supported. I don't rely on advertisers or commercial sponsors. So the second hour of today's episode with Michael is available to premium subscribers only. You can access that part of the conversation, as well as the transcripts, intelligence reports, and Michael's most recent special reports on global liquidity, which he has been kind enough to make available to premium subscribers to our super nerd tier by heading over to our website at hiddenforces.io, selecting the episode that you're interested in, and clicking on the premium extras, where you can then sign up to one of our premium content tiers. Since some of this episode deals with investing, it should be absolutely clear that nothing we say on this podcast can or should be viewed as financial advice. All opinions expressed by me and my guest are solely our own opinions and should not be relied upon as the basis for financial decisions. And with that, please enjoy this incredibly enlightening episode with my guest, Michael Howell. Michael Howell, welcome to Hidden Forces. Great. Thank you, Dimitri. Great to be here. Oh, it is my pleasure. I have uh, tweeted this already to my listeners, which I normally try to avoid doing because I don't want people to steal my guests. I don't want people to know because a lot of my work goes into deciding who to have on. But man, oh man, have I enjoyed your book, Capital Wars. I highly recommend it. It is one of the best books I've read in exploring the themes of not just global liquidity, which is obviously such a central term that we're going to talk about today, but the US dollar, capital markets, and really what drives the economic cycle, something that I think people understandably have a hard time grasping in no small part because the educational system and the frameworks that so many people got their college, master's, and even PhDs in don't really accurately capture 
what the financial system looks like today. So we're going to get into all of that. But before we do, I would love to use this opportunity to at least ask you about your background, because I think it's particularly relevant, especially your time at Salomon Brothers working under Henry Kaufman. So tell us a little bit about yourself, about your career in this industry, what you do today, and how you got to where you are today and what you do. Okay. Well, first, thanks for your kind words. Basically, uh, I began in terms of being an economist. I did a degree, a first degree. I did a master's degree around about the early 1980s at uh, London University. I focused on uh, centrally planned economies, which was actually then a pretty fashionable subject, looking closely at the Soviet Union. Uh, it was a course run by Richard Portis, who had come from Princeton over to London to uh, set up Birkbeck College. And then I proceeded in academia for a while. I uh, got a, a PhD in finance, specializing in bond markets, uh, spent a couple of years or two or three years in uh, corporate planning and industry. And then I shifted to uh, finance. I worked for Salomon Brothers. Salomon Brothers, as probably maybe people don't know, but they ought to know, was the preeminent investment bank in the 1980s. It was dominant. Everybody there looked down on Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs was sort of uh, an also ran at that time. Uh, strange to say that now, but that was true. Salomon Brothers was the world's biggest trading firm. It was the market in government bonds and Forex. And it was basically run by, uh, or it was research led. And the research department was uh, led by the geniuses of um, Henry Kaufman and Marty Leibowitz. Henry did a lot of pioneering work on flow of funds. Marty Leibowitz was a sort of doyen of the uh, of the yield curve and the bond markets. He reintroduced duration as a as a topic, and basically, Salomon Brothers was uh, really the the preeminent firm in terms of research and fixed income markets. I love this. I love this because you have so much experience, and you, in many ways, were at the ground level during the early phases of this shift from something that more closely resembled our quaint notions of industrial capitalism to something more closely resembling what I would call financial capitalism. I mentioned global liquidity. That's something that's going to come up quite a bit. What do you mean when you use that term global liquidity? Like, what is this? I feel like it's a term that we all hear. Like Many of us have used it. I use it all the time, but actually I haven't thought deeply about it. So how would you define what that is and, and why is it important to your work? Okay. I think in a straightforward way to define global liquidity, it measures the flow of money through the world financial system. Okay, that's a straightforward definition. We measure it, and we put a lot of effort into quantifying global liquidity. We measure it through the flow of cash and credit, and that cash and credit basically comes from a number of different entities. It comes from central banks. It comes from high street banks. It comes from shadow banks. It comes through cross-border flows. And we aggregate that across what is now something like 90 economies worldwide to get a feeling of what these flows really are. They're in total something like $170 trillion. They represent, what, 160% of world GDP, and they're, they're very fast growing. I mean, that's the key thing. It started out, in fact, uh, in my early days at Salomon Brothers. Salomon was, uh, as we've said, was key in the global bond markets, but it was trying to get into international and particularly international equities. And one of the things that I was tasked with doing was to go and explore the size of the international cross-border markets. In other words, to try and see how much trading volume Salomons could actually get from this business. And I started to look at the data. The US Treasury provided quite a lot of data, the UK statistical office, et cetera. And I pulled together all these data. But it was actually an interesting exercise because nobody had really done it before. There were a few academics in the US. I think Linda Taser was one, who's now, I think, at University of Michigan. She did some early work. But basically, it was a barren field. And uh, what we did was to publish a publication annually called International Equity Foes, which became the benchmark for sort of understanding this market. So that obviously leads me to a question that I want to ask, which is how that market has changed and how the flows of global liquidity have changed. That's going to be my next question. But before I ask that, I do have one more specific question, which I kind of asked, but I really didn't get a, a good enough definition from you just now, which is, what do we mean when we talk about liquidity? Like, for example, if I say I have $100 million of liquidity, mm -hmm. what do I mean when I say that? How do we define what that means and what that looks like? The way that we define it is by looking, we take it as an asset side definition 
of balance sheets, of financial sector balance sheets. Now, by focusing on balance sheets and looking at the flows of credit and the flows of cash that are passing through the system, what we're really trying to measure is the capacity, the balance sheet capacity or the capacity of capital in the system. And that becomes very important as we'll probably move on to when it comes to refinancing. And one of the things that we stress in the book Capital Wars is that the global financial system now is far less a new financing system, which is what the textbooks say, and it's much, much more a refinancing system. And that's because of the huge volumes of debt that are straining the world economy. So by liquidity, then, would you say things that are either money that we traditionally think of as money or money-like instruments, instruments that are so easily transferable that someone can very easily and reliably expect to convert at par? Is that kind of what we mean? I think that's a first-rate definition, absolutely. I think you've got to draw the distinction. The way that we think of it is in terms of means of purchase, which are things like credit instruments and means of settlement, which is much more things like money. Central banks control means of settlement. The private sector tends to create instruments, financial instruments, which are means of purchase. In other words, these are credit instruments. There is a useful definition which is around, which the academics use, and that is to distinguish between market liquidity, which is much more measures of depth. In other words, can you transact in size around current prices with minimal spreads? And funding liquidity, which is much more about the ability to obtain the financing to do that particular trade. We're That's focusing much more here on the funding dimension. That's interesting. I'd love to delve into that distinction more clearly later. One more question before we talk about how these flows have changed, and that has to do with the accuracy of our measurements. How accurate do you feel these measurements are of global liquidity? Like, What is the over-under on that 170, I think, trillion dollar number that you threw out? Well, that's a very, very interesting question, Dimitri. I think the fact is the proof of the pudding is in the eating, first of all. And you would expect these measures of liquidity to correlate very closely with asset markets, asset price movements. And they do. The correlations actually have tightened considerably over the last decade or so, but they were always pretty good. And you look at correlation coefficients of easily 0.8 between movements and liquidity and subsequent movements of asset prices. You also find high correlation between these liquidity measures and subsequent movements in the real economies. That's probably less tight. The relationship is more complex, but ultimately that would be one way of putting it. Another way is to pour into uh, detailed data that are provided by central banks. The Federal Reserve's Z1 accounts, for example, which was something that uh, Henry Kaufman pioneered the use of those way back in the 1970s and 80s. We look at those extensively as well. And our measures, which are kind of independent and actually at higher frequency than the Fed produces, we produce monthly estimates, concur pretty closely with the figures the Fed puts out. Okay. So I said I, I was curious to understand how the flows of liquidity have changed, or maybe another way of asking that is how much balance sheet capacity has expanded. Not sure mm -hmm. if those are two sides of the same coin, but how would you answer that question since your time working at Salomon Brothers? Well, I think from the times of, of Salomon Brothers, and the, the answer is enormously, but if you quantify that, and let's look at the period maybe since 1990, when the international markets were actually up and revving quite strongly, you look at global liquidity back in 1990, it was about 24 trillion. Today, it's about 165, 170 trillion. So it's actually increased by about sevenfold. Now, if you drill down into some of the detail, what you find is that actually the US share of that has increased rather faster. It's gone up by about eight times. World central banks have become, have muscled in to become you know, hugely more important. So if you take central bank balance sheets, their component of global liquidity, that's increased over that same period since 1990 by almost 17 times. And this is a huge fact. Central banks are now much, much more important in the equation than they were back in the, in the 1990s. The Federal Reserve's role has increased dramatically. That's up 20-fold since that period. But the eye-watering number is China. China's liquidity, contribution to global liquidity, is up almost 90-fold, 90-fold since 1990. China has come from nowhere. It's been allowed into the global system, and it's exploiting you know, this presence now. It uses dollars enormously. It's a major part of the international financial system. Oh, that's great, because that kind of leads me to my next question. 
And I also want to throw in another question which comes up as a result of hearing what you said about the disproportionate increase, relative increase in the role of central banks as part of this larger increase in global liquidity, which is to ask, counterintuitively, that would seem to suggest that markets would be more reliably liquid today because of the fact that central banks are are playing such a larger role in them, and yet that's not how it feels. So I'd like to just put that out there as well. But the larger question is, what are the different types of liquidity? And okay. who and what are those the drivers of those liquidity, and how important is that to understand? Okay. The way that we see this is that we look at uh, different sources of liquidity in the system. And one of the things that I think to maybe put this into context is that what we're looking at is a flow of funds accounting framework. So we're focusing very much here on sources of funds, sources of liquidity. Most economic analysis looks at uses of money, not sources. So this is a fundamental difference. And when it comes to looking at sources, we're looking very much at gross flows. Economics is very much about net flows. It doesn't really pay a lot of attention to balance sheets. Everything's netted out. Can you explain for a moment the distinction between net and gross, especially in this context? Yeah. So if you look at gross, you're looking at uh, the changes in assets and the changes in liabilities. Okay. If you're looking at net, you're netting out the change in assets minus the change in liabilities. So in other words, it's a much, much smaller part of the whole, the whole issue. I mean, a good example would be balance of payments accounts. If you look at balance of payments accounts, the gross flows are enormous. Okay, The net flows may balance out to zero, but you've got two large quantities that are moving around. Uh, another way of thinking about it is look at the federal deficit. The federal deficit may be 2 or 3% or actually a tad more now of GDP, but you've got fiscal expenditure, which may be nearly 30%, and you've got tax revenues, which are 25%. So the gross numbers are the 30 and the 25. The net is the deficit. Great. So uh, you were in the middle of answering that question I, I posed, which had to do with the types of liquidity yeah. and the different drivers of them. Sure. Well, in terms of the types, so central banks are, are very important. They've got a lot more important in the system. Then you've got the conventional banking systems. They tend to be less important now in terms of the provision of money for the financial systems. You've got shadow banks. These are institutions like finance houses, uh, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, these sort of institutions, the GSEs in the US. Basically, you've got corporate treasury departments, which are operating in the financial markets. You've got foreign exchange reserve managers, which are operating. These are all types of, if you like, doing shadow banking activity. You've got institutions doing FX swaps, repo transactions, etc. And then on top of that, you've got cross-border flows of money where investors are moving funds around between markets. So there's a significant array of different sources of liquidity, which is what we're trying to monitor. Now, if we try and nail down which are the most important sources, and clearly this has changed over time, what I would emphasize is there are three main sources right now. One are the cross-border markets. Secondly, you've got the Federal Reserve. And thirdly, you've got the People's Bank of China. So if you really want to look at three entities, you want to simplify this and bring it down to those three, those are the key players in terms of creating global liquidity right now. Can you define what you mean when you say cross-border flows? Yeah, this is basically flows of money that are shifting into and out of security markets, into and out of financial institutions between economies. So in some other words, it would be US investors investing in European stocks, or it would be Chinese investors or the Chinese foreign exchange entity buying up US treasuries, for example. These are cross-border flows of, of capital and money. Does that also capture non-central bank interventions in money market oh, funds? Oh, 100%. And, okay. So Absolutely. by default, it's also the entire private sector of money creation and provisioning of credit. Exactly right. Okay. So then that actually leads me to another question which I wanted to ask you, which I I didn't have a real answer for when I was reading your book. And and it came up for me when you, I think, talked about how China accounted for barely 6% of global liquidity in 1990, and now it accounts for 28%, and that the US went from 39 to 23. And the question has to do with ownership of liquidity. I mean, how do we, when we say that it's Chinese liquidity versus US liquidity versus German liquidity, what do we mean when we say that? Because we hear about that a lot, and, it, and it's so confusing for someone like me to 
to read. Yeah, I mean, part of this is looking at the domestic or national impact of liquidity. And one of the things that you see in China is that the evolution of money in China basically, I suppose, fast accelerated at the time when China was allowed into the WTO. China's trade performance became you know, very significant. It was a big winner from entering its WTO. China's trade surplus increased significantly. It attracted a lot of foreign direct investment, particularly from US corporations investing in China. China's foreign exchange reserves swelled significantly. And basically, the Chinese, what's called monetized that foreign exchange increase. So in other words, what they did is that they swapped the foreign exchange increase for domestic yuan currency. So China's money supply, per se, or in fact, strictly its credit growth, began to rise very significantly. And that was a major factor driving the growth rate of the Chinese economy. Now, I think as we maybe come on to later, but this was a significant support for Chinese growth. And one of the things that has changed latterly is that that monetary or credit growth or liquidity growth has stalled very badly in China for a whole number of reasons, which we can come on to. And that is something which is adversely affecting prospects for China, and actually also because of China's large economic footprint, prospects for the world economy as well. Hmm. I love that. And you know, this highlights a number of dynamics and speaks to, I think, one dynamic that we can think of in, in many different ways. One of the ways I've often thought about this is the importation of inflation on the part of the Chinese economy, for example. The US has benefited from the deflationary forces of globalization and the increased efficiency of global supply chains, et cetera, et cetera. But the opposite has been the case in China, and you just described the mechanism through which that happens, the expansion of yuan in the economy as a result of foreign exchange flows coming into the country. This is, of course, destabilizing. It was much more destabilizing to the Asian tigers during the late 1990s, something that we talked about with Russell Napier, and that's something that I would strongly suggest that listeners go back and listen to. Before we move on to my next question, Michael, which has to do with both this observation that you made early on, which is about the transformation of the financial system from one of provisioning new credit or being a new financing system to one of being a refinancing system, which I think is a truly profound observation that had a really big impact on me and that I want to explore, as well as your observation about safe asset scarcity and the important role of collateral. I cannot emphasize this enough. This is something that we talked about with Lev Menand, and it's something that I think very few people, again, understandably have an appreciation for, which is the role of safe collateral in the provisioning of credit and its role in the expansion of global liquidity. Before we cover those two things, I, I do want to tie off this last thing that you brought up again earlier, which had to do with, I think it was funding versus trading liquidity or funding versus market liquidity. Market liquidity, what, funding. Market liquidity. liquidity. Correct. So what is the distinction there between the two? Well, market liquidity is really the result of what we think of as funding liquidity. So in other words, market liquidity is, if, if let me step back and say, if you're a trader in the markets or somebody buying securities, you've got to be able to buy a sufficient volume of securities at around current quoted prices. And you will be quoted by a dealer price and size. So you may be able to transact $10 million of a trade at around current prices. If you suddenly say, well, okay, I want to trade 100 million, they're going to give you a different price. And that price may change quite noticeably. Now, that can often be measured by bid-ask spreads in the market or the, the amount that a dealer will t accept in terms of volume. So that's really a measure of market liquidity. If there is enough funding and enough securities in the system, you will basically be able to achieve market liquidity, good market liquidity. If market liquidity deteriorates, you often get that is often a hint or a signal that funding liquidity has also deteriorated prior to that time. Funding liquidity is much more about the ability to have the credit to enact the trade from both sides, yeah. from the buyer and the seller's perspective. So market liquidity is a function of funding liquidity. Correct, yeah. Is another way of thinking about market liquidity as, for example, the ability to transact at the most recently transacted price. Exactly. And the larger 
your transaction, the closer you are to be able to transact at that price is a function of the funding liquidity, of the prevailing amounts of liquidity. Exactly right. One of the things that you can actually track on a daily basis from the New York Federal Reserve is trade fails among primary dealers. And that is probably a pretty good heads up to deteriorating market liquidity. It's starting to escalate quite significantly in the US right now. It's a sign of deteriorating funding liquidity conditions. And that's one of the things that we look at as a, for a cross-check. So that's bad market liquidity means probably prior poor funding liquidity. Hmm. Great. So I was mentioning earlier that I wanted to talk about, or I wanted to transition us to a conversation about both this observation around refinancing and around safe collateral or safe assets as collateral for lending. Because you do a great job of highlighting how these two things work in conjunction of the book. Let's talk about safe assets first. What constitutes a safe asset? And is there a formal and or regulatory definition? For example, is tier one capital a safe asset? Like, How do we think about what this is tangibly? There are several definitions of what safe assets are. I mean, my sort of working definition is to say, you know, what you're looking at is what might be called pristine collateral. So it's basically uh, reserve currencies. So things like the US dollars, euros, sterling pound, Swiss franc. It's also government bonds in the major economies. So it would be US Treasury's primary asset, safe asset. That's true for most economies. They'll look at US Treasury bonds for that. Maybe UK sterling gilts, maybe bunds in Germany, etc. These are collateral instruments that we know are robust in price. So you've got a pretty good idea what the value of those are, and they're not they're, the volatility in price is not going to be great. So they're pretty secure instruments. Okay. So like I said in the book and in other papers that you've published, you talk about how there has been a, a shortage of safe assets. Correct. Now, I think for some people, this will <laughs> strike them as counterintuitive because the safe assets are traditionally government debt sovereign securities, primarily the sovereign securities of the United States, maybe German bonds, Japanese bonds, et cetera. Help me understand and help my listeners understand how that's come about and what you, you mean and how can there be a shortage of government debt when it seems to be that governments keep expanding their outstanding liabilities? Yeah, it's a very good point, Dimitri. I think the first thing to say is that if you go back to the pre-2008 pre-GFC financial system, a lot of it was based on interbank lending and trust. Okay, Trust, unfortunately, has disappeared from financial markets to a very large extent. And so the fallback position is collateral. In other words, safe assets. And you've got to, first of all, see the jump from that event, the 2008 crisis, to the new world, where you've moved away from trust to collateral. So collateral is really the key thing. Let me interject before you continue, just so I can clarify something. When you say trust, do you mean specifically trust in the banking system? Correct. Got it. If you were another bank, I would lend to you without necessarily any security. So this is unsecured lending. And unsecured lending used to be much more dominant or prevalent than it is right now. Uh, A lot of lending is now basically secured against collateral. And that's one of the ways, one of the results that has come out of uh, 2008. So that's point number one. There's a step change. Point number two is that what we're really talking about when we talk about liquidity is not the traditional M numbers like M1 or M2. We're looking at liquidity measures or credit measures that pretty much start where the M2s or other Ms end. So we're looking very much at financial sector money. So I'm not really thinking here about uh, looking at uh, prints on US M2 money supply. I'm looking at a, at a much broader concept of financial sector liquidity, money that's moving through financial markets. And I think that's key. As that money through financial markets escalates in size, it's expanded dramatically, as we've said, global liquidity you know, dramatically since 1990, eightfold in the US, sevenfold globally, etc. It needs more collateral because collateral is one of the ways that that liquidity is created. It can be created by central banks, 
board. It's created by private institutions. They basically do that on the back of collateral. So there's a demand for collateral. Third point is, what have central banks been doing for much of the last few years? They've been engaged in quantitative easing policies. How do those quantitative easing policies fulfilled? They're largely through buying up in the secondary markets, government debt, the very safe assets that the private sector really needs. Now, that means that, you know, as they say in the UK, you're sort of robbing Peter to pay Paul. I don't know if that expression translates, but you get the idea. And basically, the problem that the world financial system has now is there is a shortage of collateral, not only because of the growth of the financial markets, but also because the central banks have been coming in and taking these safe assets. Now, to give you one example, look at the German Bund, which is the key safe asset in the euro system. How much free float is there of the 10-year Bund? The free float has dropped to about 10% because the ECB, the European Central Bank, has been hoovering up so many. So let's dig into this. This is fascinating for me. It really is. So besides the obvious fact that you can measure the outstanding, the free float of German bonds, what are the other indicators that we can look at to determine whether there's funding stress as a result of a shortage of collateral? What do we see in our yields on government securities, a way to measure this? Like, what are the indicators that we rely on to understand that this is happening? And to also like to be able to track its history, like to your point that this is something that really stemmed out of the, the 2008 financial crisis. I think you can look at a number of things. I mean, one is there, is there are some fantastic data sources in the US. The Office of Financial Research does a lot of daily work on uh, stresses in the financial system in the US. US academics, Gary Gordon, for example, has done a lot of work on safe assets you know, there's a lot of research going on about uh, the role of safe assets in the system. A very simple way is to look at maybe short-term spreads between secured lending and unsecured lending. If that spread widens, it may well be telling us that there's a shortage of collateral in the system. And that's one of the things that we've been seeing through this year. Again, if you look at term premia, which is, a, I know, a wonkish concept, but term premia in the fixed income markets that if you like, the risk premium on treasuries have gone significantly negative. Now, that, that is either a sign that the economy is likely to tank significantly, which, hey, it may be, or it's equally a sign that there's a shortage of collateral in the system. So by term premia, for those who are listening, you're referring to the additional yield that you expect to pick up the further you go out on the yield curve. And when term premium go negative, it speaks to the inversion of the curve. Correct. It's a dominant part in the inversion of the curve. I mean, this is the other thing that I just want to highlight that has been confusing for me as a sort of outside observer of the financial system and not as someone who has, who's in the guts of it, working on it from various angles every single day, which is that a lot of the traditional values of, of certain indicators, like the bond market and a bond inversion, that we were taught in school or in academia don't necessarily reflect reality today because of some of these perverse changes in the financial system. And you know, another thing that comes up, you know, during this conversation for me that I've thought about a number of times since we started talking is the extent to which central banks have effectively liquefied markets by adding non-sovereign securities to their balance sheet. In other words, expanding the universe of instruments that they've been willing to effectively support. And by doing so, they've kind of made them more money-like. Is that also Does that also reflect, to your point, the shortage of safe assets? That in other words, because in part because central banks have been purchasing so many of these high-quality assets, that there haven't been enough high-quality assets to lend against. And as a result, every time we end up having these periodic stresses in the system or financial crises, central banks step in and effectively backstop a larger and larger percentage of the universe of private assets. Yeah, absolutely correct. I mean, this is the history of financial markets. I think you've nailed it exactly. And you know, if you go back and you look at you know, what capitalism or modern capitalism does, it really does two things. I mean, one is that it creates cost deflation in the real economy through productivity, technology, Etc. You know, seeking out cheap materials, raw materials, whatever. But it creates monetary inflation in financial markets. Monetary inflation really matters for the asset markets because asset markets 
almost driven 100% by monetary inflation. Okay, The global liquidity features that I'm discussing is all monetary inflation. Whereas the high street prices that everyone suffers are a combination of cost deflationary pressures and some monetary inflation. And we've seen the spillover of monetary inflation in the last uh, year or so in CPI prints, for sure. But it's the asset markets that have really experienced the waves of global liquidity that come through. And what central banks basically do is that they're forced to come in and, if you like, backstop the system time and time again, because the private sector always wants to create more financial instruments and more liquidity. That's the nature of capitalism. That's how it works. Now, one of my sort of two big wow moments, (laughs) if you like, in financial markets was when I worked at Salomon Brothers and I was on the New York trading floor of Salomon's just after the 87 crash, about a week or so afterwards. And I was chatting to a trader and he stopped mid-conversation to take a call, scribbled down a big order, and he turned to me and said, that's the Fed buying futures. Wow, (laughs) the Federal Reserve's not supposed to do that, right? But it was. There from the horse's mouth, we heard a trader taking an order from the Fed to try and support the markets. It happened way back then as well. It's happening again now, but it's happening in a different way. But actually, explicitly, if you look at the, the Swiss National Bank, they buy equities. The Japanese are buying ETFs. This is the nature of the game. It's supporting. The central banks are here for the long term, supporting the markets. Don't believe that QE is going to go away. It's not. It's back. We made a, a comment, maybe a bold comment, after the 87 crash. Is don't expect a single QE. Expect QE1, QE2, QE3, QE4. This is like a bottle of headache pills that the financial system has to keep swallowing. So this, again, there's so many questions I have for you because this is kind of like a thick fog of confusion for me. And this conversation is very helpful in kind of sorting out a lot of outstanding questions that I've had. So one of them that kind of comes out of this is, all right, so clearly we would rather have, at least I think this makes sense to me, have the government issue more securities, issue more debt, assuming it has a viable plan for using it to invest in things like infrastructure and defense or whatever it is that be for a larger public purpose, we would rather have that than have the private sector do it, then get bailed out every time we end up having a financial crisis. That only benefits a very small number of private actors. So that's kind of public policy for private gain. So certainly we would rather have the former. But one could argue that this is just an indication that the price of capital should be higher. That in other words, it isn't that we should be issuing more government securities in order to give the private sector the collateral it needs to issue more credit, but rather that so much credit shouldn't be issued. So how should one think about that dichotomy or that paradox? Well, I think the interest rates are a very good segue into this. And if you look at, or if you go back to the 19th century in the UK, the London financial markets were a real ro- roller coaster of ups and downs in, in asset prices and bankruptcies and booms and whatever, booms and crashes, etc. And in many ways, the 19th century or Victorian financial markets in London are pretty much what the world is seeing right now. It's a repeat of that. You had you know, large shadow banks over in Gurney, which defaulted in the mid-19th century, celebrated default, was the world's biggest shadow bank at the time. Okay, It was a massive institution. The Bank of England refused to bail that out. That movement was, or those swings, very much what we're seeing now. Out of that sort of maelstrom or chaos came Walter Badgett, the sort of doyen of central banking, who was a a journalist, a financial journalist at the time, basically came up with the Badgett rule. And the Badgett rule is lend freely against good security at a high rate of interest. Okay, What are central banks doing now? The exact reverse of that. Okay, that's the error. You know, interest rates are too low. But the issue is that if you come back to these two drivers of capitalism, cost deflation and monetary inflation, one of the results that comes out of that is low nominal interest rates. The problem is that low nominal interest rates incentivize debt. And people take on more and more debt. The problem is that debt saddles the world economy. It's a dead weight on growth. We've got to get off that hook You've got to get the level of interest rates up. But unfortunately, we're stuck in this sort of vicious circle of lower interest rates. And that's what the markets are expecting now, that at some stage in 23, the Fed's going to come back and slash rates again. 
That's very interesting. So flesh that out for me. What you're, what you're basically saying is that there's a direct relationship between the shortage and safe assets, the rising levels of private sector debt, and the long downward slide in global interest rates. Yeah, there's a, a nexus between debt, liquidity, and interest rates. And let me just sort of you know come back to this point that you know where financial markets are now, they they are a refinancing mechanism, not the textbook model of a new financing system. If you pick up an economic textbook, they say what are the capital markets for? It's basically for new investment. Well, hey, where, where's the new investment? Okay, well, most of it's going on probably in China right now. It's not really happening in the West. But you look at the, you go through the math of this, and you say, well, look, okay. We're living in a world where there's $350 trillion of debt. That's three and a half times world GDP on my estimates, okay? That debt, which may or may not be a dead weight, but probably is on the world economy, has an average maturity or lifespan of about five years, okay? Which means that if you divide 350 by five, you get 70 trillion, which is the amount of debt that has to be rolled over every year, okay? So which is a huge amount. And that needs liquidity or balance sheet capacity to actually make the role. And that's why if you look back at financial crises over the last 20 years, they've always been refinancing crises. Now, compare that with the CapEx spend. World GDP is about 100 trillion. A fifth is probably CapEx. About half of that CapEx, which admittedly most of the CapEx, as I said, is in Asia, not in the West, but half of that CapEx is funded externally, which means about 10 trillion goes through capital markets. So what you're doing is you're comparing a 70 trillion number of refinancing or rolls with 10 trillion. And in a world where refinancing is critical, interest rates matter a lot less. What really matters is whether you, you're going to get the roll, otherwise you're going to default or lose your home. All right, let's dig into this a little bit more. So when we're talking about refinancing, are we defining that in part by looking at maturity levels? So like anything below five years, anything above five years is not considered refinancing, or it is anything that needs to be rolled over over time, any pre-existing liability that needs continued financing in order to sustain itself over time. Well, the five-year figure I gave you is an average, and there's uh, you know a big distribution. Some stuff is 30-year debt, some is maybe 100-year debt, some is one month or two months. But the average maturity of that debt is circa around five years. Right. And well, so just to go back to something else you said about the 2008 financial crisis, to your point about refinancing, that was a crisis that began as a crisis of illiquidity Correct. as opposed to necessarily solvency. Yeah, it was about bad liabilities. It was a right, funding exactly. crisis. So I want to dig in and understand this a bit more because I think it's actually quite fascinating because it pulls in distinctions between the developed world, the developing world, between the status quo and change. What does it mean? And maybe also help me understand, because you threw out a figure of 70 trillion for debt with a maturity of about five years. You threw out a number of 10 trillion for, or 20 trillion for CapEx, 10 of which is foreign finance, I think you said. What percentage of outstanding global debt is actually there to refinance existing liabilities and existing commitments? And how does that relate to the global economy's capacity to meet new opportunities for growth and investment. Does that make sense, that kind of yeah. the contours of that question? Yeah, I, th I think I understand what you're saying. I, think, I mean, basically, the question is, is the debt going to be repaid or is it going to be rolled? Well, the answer is it's normally rolled. It's not repaid. Okay, That tends to be experience. So what you see is a growing debt pile. We never pay the debt off. It is basically we're kicking the can down the road the whole time. And that's the issue. The question is, what speed are we kicking the can down the road? And with interest rates being at low levels, that debt pile is escalating all the time. What I wanted to actually clarify is that it's not exactly what I'm asking. What I'm asking is because of the dynamics that you've just highlighted, those dynamics, it seems that the eventuality is that the debt becomes such an enormous burden that all financial resources go towards maintaining the status quo. And that becomes politically unfeasible. I mean, does that kind of make sense, what I'm yeah, saying? And also, it eats into future growth and the yeah. capacity to repay the debt because all of this is funded through ultimately money that is itself a liability and that comes with interest attached. 
Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, it, you know, at some stage, there's an end game. <laughs> I'm the first to say that. The question is that that end game may be decades in the future. And, you know, there's this celebrated study is it, yeah, by uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff on debt, which I think came up with a magic figure of 77% or whatever the number was for a debt GDP ratio. Well, hey, we've surpassed that. We surpassed that through the COVID crisis for many economies. We're still here. We're still breathing. And that debt ratio could go up, could escalate dramatically. It could go up. You know, look at what's happening in Japan. We're nearly, what, 400% there. So in other words, it's a long road and we've got to kick the can down quite a long way. Now, what are the implications there? I think there are several. But I think one of the other points I think we've got to make alongside this is how the nature of the financial system has changed, given this emphasis on funding and maybe liability management. And if you look at the security markets, one of the things we're always taught is that investors have a free choice on what to buy. Okay, So you make you know, sensible, logical decisions about the relative yield of different securities. Well, hey, there's a large constituency out there who don't have the choice to buy. They have to buy. Okay. One of the things, one of the significant moments in US finance was the ERISA Act, which was in September of 74, if I remember, which is the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. What that laid down was funding rules and the need for diversification. Now, if you look at the stock market or the securities markets in the mid-1980s when I joined Salomon Brothers, a quick analysis of flow of funds in the US would say about 18% of transactions were enacted by liability managers. In other words, managers had to buy securities regardless of what the yield or their prospects were. That was, if you like, the safe asset backing, to use your term. What's that figure today? I figure it's 42%. That was the figure that we estimated looking at current US flow of funds accounts. So 40% of the market is not open to sensible security analysis. It's basically either passive funds, index funds that have really come into vogue after the, the Pension Protection Act in 2006, which is forcing or encouraging a lot of pension plans to move into passive. Okay, So those flows of income just go straight into passive. Or it's liability managers with Forex reserve managers, or it's uh, pension plans, or it's insurance companies who have to get duration to match liabilities. And that's one of the key things to note. So, you know, unfortunately, Graham and Dodd's value analysis, you know, which is supposedly how the financial markets work, has been eclipsed by these flows of liquidity and liability management. And it's why the whole concept that Salomon Brothers reinvented or Marty Leibowitz reinvented back in the 1970s of duration is so important to understand. So what you're kind of speaking to there, it sounds like, is something that we've discussed with Michael Green, which is the increased role of systematic flows over discretionary allocation of capital. Absolutely right. Spot on. That's exactly the point. Yeah. So I want to actually bring it back to something I was saying before, because I, I want to dig into a bit more, which has to do with the sort of compounding nature of debt in the context of what we're describing here, and specifically in the context of this provisioning of more safe assets. Because on the one hand, it makes sense in the short term that the issuance of more safe collateral in the form of, let's say, US sovereign securities, particularly US treasuries, and the finite spectrum of securities issued by governments that are deemed either credible or which have a sort of endogenous demand for their currency like the United States, that this would in the short term reduce interest rates. But in the long term, eventually, wouldn't people lose confidence in this asset? In other words, at what point does the does the safe asset tip into being unsafe? And at that point, you know, what does the world look like and how close are we to something like that, which I think is kind of the end game that many people have been trying to wrap their arms around? Yeah, I think it's almost an impossible question to answer. But you look at, you know, maybe what the Japanese have been doing to their financial system in various ways. And I mean, apart from, let's say, wobbles in the yen, which we can debate about what the cause of that is, actually, the financial system has been remarkably robust, you know, however much they've kicked it. And I think that's one of the things we've got to say. There's a lot of inertia in the system. So maybe we can treat the financial system badly for some considerable time. And that's really the danger, I think, in many ways. Does that mean that at some point, 
we have to have a, a system reset, a global restructuring driven by either governments on a national level or internationally as a kind of Bretton Woods framework, like what we had after the end of World War II in order to fix this system? I think the answer to that is probably. But then if you look at these resets, as you highlighted, they normally come after wars. Let's not predict that. But I mean, you know, that's the sad reality of these things. And I think we can discuss Bretton Woods, I think, is a critical element, you know, further. But, you know, my contention is there's that Bretton Woods still exists. The broad parameters of Bretton Woods are still with us, which is the centrality of the US dollar, the importance of the US military, and the policing by major institutions like the IMF and the World Bank, and, you know, the so-called Washington Consensus. That's still very much with us. All the talk about Bretton Woods 2 and uh, Bretton Woods 3, I, I just, I don't entertain. Bretton Woods 1 is still very much intact. The Chinese may be trying to challenge that, but hey, that's a different story. Well, that's exactly where I want to take the second hour of our conversation, Michael, including a conversation about the Yuan, because it's something that you talk about in the book. It's something that we've explored with various guests on this podcast, including James Aitken. I mean, so much to highlight here, the US dollar, Bretton Woods, a new international currency system, what it would take for something like that to come about, how long would it would take, how durable the US dollar is. Because again, what's that famous quote by Mark Twain, the rumors of my death have been greatly exaggerated. The rumors of the dollar's demise have been greatly exaggerated. And so what are the real risks to the US dollar? And what impact the US dollar has on the competitive of, of American industry? And are there gonna be lobbying efforts internally from the United States to actually change the regime. In other words, that the dollar doesn't die because other countries want to displace it, but rather because it becomes a burden on the United States. Also, how do investors, that's another question that, you know, is something that I'm always thinking about, which is how do inv investors navigate this kind of rock in a hard place between dollar strength and the possible immediacy at some point in the future of a regime shift in the global currency. And, and on top of that, not just the, quote, secular sort of risk of a change in the global currency and where one can find in, in the long-term liquidity, but also in the short term, because of the instability that this creates, how does one maintain liquidity confidently? That's something else right. that I've thought quite a bit about. So you know, I, I threw out a bunch of those things, but we're going to pick them apart one by one in the second hour, Michael. For anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second hour of today's conversation with Michael, as well as the episode transcripts, intelligence reports, and Michael's most recent special reports on global liquidity, which he has been kind enough to make available to premium subscribers to our super nerd tier, head over to hiddenforces.io and check out our episode library, where you can also become a premium subscriber today. Michael, stick around. We're going to move the second part of our conversation onto the premium feed. Great. Look forward to it. Thanks, Dimitri. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to full episodes, transcripts, and intelligence reports, which include additional notes, resources, links, and other material that will help you get the most out of each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website at hiddenforces.io. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.